back again with another question show. As always, wherever you are on the channel, on watching any video, whether it's this question show or any others, if a question pops in your mind, just type it in. I'll gather them all up and answer them here. And did you like the uh, present last week from Dr. Paul Metzetter? We've got another one this week, another guest answerer, but you'll have to stick around to the end. All right, let's get started. Slain Makroth. Can a black hole swallow dark matter? Before I answer this, we always got to say we don't know what dark matter is, whether it is some, you know, what kind of particle it is. But right now, most astronomers are, and particle physicists are sort of settling on this idea that dark matter is some kind of, you know, particle, but it doesn't interact with regular matter and it doesn't give off any kind of electromagnetic radiation. That said, all of the astronomers that I've talked to believe that if dark matter is out there and it is some kind of particle, then it absolutely can fall into a black hole because dark matter, even though it doesn't interact with regular matter in terms of radiation and things like that, it definitely interacts with gravity and that's what black holes are all about. So if a black hole has distorted space time and a particle of dark matter is passing along and it follows that path into the black hole, it would be consumed by the black hole. What, what would happen inside? We don't know what's going on inside black holes. And, you know, what kind of particle is it? We still don't know, but I feel pretty confident that it would follow that path into the black hole. Black Hole asks, shouldn't you know this? Anyway, can a star become so large and hot that it turns black as it no longer emits visible light? Right, so as a star gets larger and contains more mass, it gets hotter and hotter and more massive and hotter. And there's this kind of this limit, which is somewhere around like 150 times the mass of the sun, where as the material is falling in, the star gets so hot and so bright, and it's producing these ferocious solar winds that no more material can fall down onto them. So that's kind of the limit of, of how much a star can accumulate at this time in the universe. Back in the early universe, they could have gotten a lot bigger, maybe thousands of times the mass of the sun. But so you've got this star, but and so the largest possible stars that we know of we can see them. They are blue, they're so hot, but still they're way, have way less gravity than, for example, a neutron star or definitely a black hole. You would have to take that size of that sun and then compress it down into an object that's tiny before you would get it to a point that it would no longer emit its radiation, that it would, it would absorb all of the radiation that it's emitting because it would have turned into a black hole. So, there's no stars that can do that. Now, when a star dies, then that's when you do get a black hole, but only under that process. Sithel. Would not traveling faster than the speed of light actually make you able to travel to the past? No. Now, now I understand where you're sort of going this, right? Which is that you're traveling through space and you are traveling faster than the speed of light. And so you turn around and you can start to see the wavelengths that left, say, the Earth and they are bumping in, you know, they're passing by you, and you're starting to see things that happened in the past. Absolutely. But you're not actually going to be traveling into the past, because if you then turned your spaceship around and went back to Earth with all these things that you saw, as you got closer and closer to the Earth, you, your time would catch up to the Earth, and then the moment you landed, it would be the present time again. But if you wanted to see into the, into the ancient past of the, of the Earth, for example, you could fly faster than the speed of light, go out to say, I don't know, 2,000 light years, turn around, and then look back and see what was happening on Earth 2,000 years ago. So it lets you see into the past, but not travel into the past physically. Christopher Wright, a question for you. Do you think it's likely that we'll create a probe that will outpace Voyager 1 into the void? I was reading up on the Oort cloud and was just blown away at the vastness of space and how long Voyager will take to get even remotely close to it. Yeah, the Oort cloud is mind-bendingly big, like thousands of astronomical uni units, 50,000 astronomical units. It is like closing in on a light year away from the Earth is the sort of the scale of these particles that are around the around the, the Sun. So for us to be able to get an object out into the Oort cloud, even at our fastest speeds, is going to take us thousands of years, which is crazy. So there, w there must be a faster way to do this. And I think the best way to do this is this idea, the, the, the Breakthrough Starshot mission, which Stephen Hawking is involved in and um, and a bunch of other people, which would take a, like a tiny 
uh, solar sail, you attach this microscopic chip to it, and then you zap the solar sail so that it's going some significant portion of the speed of light. Now they've used this idea to say, oh, we, this is how we could get to another star. But actually, I think this is a great way for us to just explore the solar system. That you could zap, say, a thousand of these at Pluto, and zap a thousand of these at Eris, and, and, and try to send a whole bunch of them out into the Oort cloud. So we could try to map out the regions in the solar system with much more accuracy than we know today. But right now, that Oort cloud is really just theorized because it's so far away. The only way that we know it's there is because occasionally comets fall down in and towards the inner solar system. And I know that there are a bunch of planetary scientists who would love to be able to look at some of those objects out in the Oort cloud before they've done this fall down towards the sun. Hervelian, why would a Type II civilization's Dyson sphere leak out infrared radiation? If they have the technology to encompass a star, they probably have the technology to do it properly. Right. This is based on a question that we talk about, and I've mentioned this a few times now, this idea that, that we could look for Type II civilizations, the ones who have enclosed their sun in some kind of Dyson sphere, because that would give off a very specific heat signature. And in fact, you could look out and look for galaxies where every single star in the entire galaxy has been surrounded by one of these Dyson spheres, and so you would get a signature from the entire galaxy. Now, now, why would they leak out that radiation? Well, it's just because that's the laws of thermodynamics. In the end of the day, heat is going to escape. Now, you could trap some of that heat and try to reuse it, but eventually some kind of radiation is going to leak out from this type 1 civilization. You know, when you imagine the Dyson swarm is going to be surrounded the star, they're going to be hit by the light from the sun, they're going to warm up, and they're going to use this, this heat for electricity, and they're going to use this to have great big habitats that can have quadrillions of people living in them, but then the back of these worlds are going to leak out infrared radiation into space. And maybe they're going to have a bigger Dyson swarm that's going to try and catch a lot of that infrared radiation, but they're going to leak infrared radiation. At the end of the day, you kind of can't stop heat from escaping your entire system. And so that's why we think that we would be able to look for them out in space. What else is on? Do all galaxies contain dark matter? Is dark matter strictly necessary for the formation of galaxies? If a galaxy were to not contain dark matter, how would it behave differently? Not only is a galaxy have dark matter, in fact, the galaxies have 10 times as much dark matter as regular matter. So you've got this, the reg, you know, this, imagine the spiral galaxy, and then this vast halo of dark matter that surrounds it that's invisible but we can measure it by the way the, the gravity of this dark matter bends the light that's coming from, from behind it. And so the dark matter is actually kind of the anchor for the galaxy itself. It's what allows the galaxy to orb, to turn and spin at the rate that it does without flying apart. The, and so this is how um, astronomers originally figured out that there was such a thing as dark matter because they calculated how quickly these galaxies are turning and said, well, based on the matter that's in them, they should be flying apart. So there must be something else that's there. And since then, the dark matter, we still don't know what it is, but it's been mapped very carefully and very precisely so we understand kind of where it is and how much of it there is and how much it's doing. So <clears throat> you can get situations where dark matter and say the gas and dust that's in a galaxy are separated from one another, but in general, all of the galaxies have some big dark matter halo around them. Josiah Evans, wouldn't a machine that makes more energy than it consumes be perpetual? So this question was in relation to fusion, how you put hydrogen into the fusion reactor and then the whole thing heats up and essentially the more energy is coming out of the fusion reactor than is being put in to start the fusion reaction. But no, it doesn't use up more energy than it puts out because it's using up fuel. The fuel is the hydrogen. So as long as you keep going and taking water and splitting apart and grabbing the hydrogen and putting that into the combustion reactor area, then, you, then the thing will run. And as soon as you run out of that hydrogen fuel, then the fusion reactor will shut down. Isaac Grimes. One of my friends told me that there's a massive pool of water under rockets when they launch. If this is true, if so, why? Yeah, there is a pool of water that's underneath rockets, or if you like watch the launch of the space shuttle, and maybe we'll put a video here, they have these huge hoses that shoot water 
underneath the engines of the space shuttle engines as the whole thing is taking off. And what this is for, it's called acoustic dampening. And so when the, the rocket is launching, it's putting out so much power and vibration and noise that the noise can rattle the rocket and destroy it. And so they put down this water and this pool to absorb the noise and the, and, and the vibrations that are coming off of the rocket so that it doesn't do any damage to the rocket and the gantry. And so that's why they do it. Dave Owacko. I, I think I'm getting what you're saying here. Put a big shield around the sun so that it gathers up the helium and hydrogen and puts it back into the sun. And then there's lots of ways you can keep the sun alive. Right, so you can imagine the sun is firing out this solar wind out into space, it's particles of hydrogen and helium, and you could capture them, say with your Dyson swarm that's surrounding the sun, and then you could deliver that material back to the sun, and you could help provide more fuel to the sun. But there's only so far that's going to last you. At the end of the day, what matters is the hydrogen that's down in the core of the sun which is actually a small fraction of the total hydrogen that's in the sun. And that once that hydrogen gets used up in the core, then the sun is out of fuel. If we had some way that we could stir up the sun, then we could try to make it live longer. And we've actually had videos that talk about this. First rising soul. The mass of the observable universe is less now than it was in the early universe because matter leaves our cosmic horizon. Hey First Rising Soul, thank you so much for joining the comments. I've seen all of the other answers that you've been doing and I know you have a background in this so I really appreciate you jumping in and, uh, and providing some, some additional answers. So keep it up, thank you so much. And I'd like to interview you at some point. Anyway, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. So we talked about sort of like, you know, will the total amount of matter in the universe remain the same? And we talked about how, well, you know, that matter can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be changed. And so the total of like mass, energy, balance of the universe will remain the same. But the reality is that in the observable universe, right, not the total universe, but in the observable universe, there is this cosmic horizon that over long periods of time, material is slipping away from our observable universe. It's getting beyond what we can ever see. And so that matter is leaving our cosmic horizon. And so you can imagine that material is, is exiting our universe, our observable universe. And eventually you might end up with an observable universe with no matter in it at all, which is kind of mind bending to think about. We're gonna be doing an episode about various kinds of horizons, particle horizons, cosmic horizons. That's coming up in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned. Red Star. Why SETI scanning the sky for alien broadcasts seems stupid and pointless as it's useless and redundant that an advanced alien civilization would use radio broadcasts to communicate over such a large distance. Well, the reason the SETI program exists in this case is that, yeah, we're not gonna be overhearing the communications of alien civilizations talking to each other. We're going to be hearing the communications that they are directly sending to us. They are sending a message to Earth to earthlings for some reason. Now, how do they know we're here? Well, because the atmosphere of the earth has been giving away our presence for 500 million years, right? Any alien civilization with a powerful enough telescope can look at the earth and know there's life on that planet by, the, by essentially what's in our atmosphere. And more recently, if they're closer, they could say, oh, they have pollution. Oh, they went through the industrial age at this time. So they know exactly where they are. And, the, and the, we know this because we're going to be exactly at that point in, in another couple of decades. You know, as the James Webb Space Telescope gets online, it's going to be able to look at, other, at the atmospheres of other worlds and maybe know if there's life there. And more powerful telescopes. In 100 years, we will totally have the kinds of telescopes that will let us identify the planet's orbiting suns nearby us that have life on it and maybe even the ones that have intelligent life. So that's why. And so we're assuming that they're going to be sending a message to us. Now, is this the communication system that the aliens use today? Probably not, right? They've probably advanced to neutrinos or quantum communication beams or something that works for them, but they're dumbing it down for us because they know that we're a brand new civilization and chances are we've learned how to use radio waves and so they're being polite and they're communicating directly at us with radio waves. And that's sort of the assumption that SETI researchers are making. So once again, I've pulled in another guest answerer, the Astro Focus YouTube channel. Now, here's the question that I sent them. Christian Day, hey there, love the channel. How do we figure out what the Milky Way looks like 
like the type of galaxy and how do we figure out our location in it. Thanks Fraser. This is a really good question and one that is not at all obvious. Let's start by figuring out where we are in our galaxy. It's like deducing your location as a tree in a dense forest, where you are one tree surrounded by thousands of trees. So how do we know that we are a point three fifths away from the edge of the galaxy? First of all, we know we aren't at the top or bottom of the disk because it would look much larger in the sky like this, rather than somewhat of a line we see. Well, if we know the distance to all the stars we can see, then we can work out where our solar system is located in our galaxy. So, William Herschel in the late 18th century measured the distance to the most distant stars in the galaxy his telescope could observe. With this, he estimated that we are located near the centre of the galaxy, which we know now is completely wrong. He forgot to take into account small particles of interstellar dust, which blocked the light of some stars, rendering his experiment invalid. The first experiment to somewhat accurately find our place in the galaxy was conducted by Harlow Shapley, who measured the distance to large clusters of stars called globular clusters, bright dense groups of stars that are visible from far away. Shapley, like Herschel, presumed that dimmer clusters were farther away. He noticed that most of these clusters were in one part of the night sky, and after mapping these clusters, he found they formed a sphere, more or less. So he concluded that the middle of the sphere would be the centre of the Milky Way, meaning that Earth would be far from the middle of the galaxy, and astronomers have since then verified this. In recent times, astronomers have used other techniques such as infrared telescopes because dust doesn't block infrared light as much. Astronomers have also used techniques such as radio, optical, infrared and even X-ray imaging. With these recent observations, we are able to conclude that our solar system is located on the inner edge of a spiral arm, about 25,000 light years from the centre of the galaxy. How do we know our type of galaxy? There are three broad types of galaxies, elliptical, spiral and irregular galaxies. Spiral galaxies stay somewhat on a flat plane, while the others prominently stretch out vertically. This means that if we view the galaxy from the edge, we should be able to see a line, not stretching out much vertically. This eliminates the other types of galaxies, so we most likely live in a spiral galaxy. And we have also noticed that the properties of our galaxy are very like those of other spiral galaxies, besides our own. Dust content, gas fraction and the colour of our galaxy are strikingly similar to other spiral galaxies, like M31 for example. So I hope I have answered your question. Well, thanks Astrofocus for providing the answer. If you haven't already, you've absolutely got to go and subscribe to their channel. It's great. And I really appreciate him jumping in and providing a guest answer. All right, well, that's it. Uh, we've reached the end of another question show. Thanks as always to everyone who's sent in their questions. Th special thanks to Astrofocus for answering one of the questions. Wherever you are on any of my videos, just go ahead, type in a question, and I will try to get to it here. Now, we'll wrap up this episode with another playlist, things I'm watching on YouTube this week. Enjoy. <laughs>